Welcome to TRS Clips, where you'll find happiness through your own curiosity. The narrative in the public eye is that uh, you left working with the Modi government because your opinions weren't heard. No, I I actually could do everything I needed to do. Uh, one of the interesting issues is I had a very good working relationship both with the prime minister and the finance minister. And um, you know, I told you about the bank cleanup. I went to the finance minister and I said, "Look, we've identified such big levels of NPAs." I'm I'm not accusing you at all. Yes, no, no, I'm no. Not I'm a just I'm just saying that that you know uh, that was not the issue that. we 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 had a good working relationship everything we wanted done we managed to persuade the government as i said there's a job of persuasion there's jitpit that always goes on but you have to overlook that and and so long as you have a good relationship with the people in power you can get things done was there a reason you didn't do too many media interactions back then versus you doing media interactions now look i saw my job then as communicating policy why are we doing what we're doing so for example i remember the i was uh, you know trying to explain why you know lower inflation was a good thing somebody was complaining ki hamare interest rates kam ho gaye uh, we had fixed deposit rates we were earning 9% and now they've come down to 6% uh, how can this be a good thing and i told them this 6% because inflation has come down so much and actually you're making money more money on your deposits than you were making earlier and i gave an example which became known as dosa economics <laughs> how they could afford more dosas because interest rates were in real terms that is when you subtract inflation from the interest rate they were getting were actually higher and and so there is a job of communicating why the policy mix that you're following makes sense and i think that that was something i did a lot you know sometimes uh, in a platform like this you also want to caution uh, the the uh, sometimes there's a sense of triumphalism ki sab kuch theek ho raha hai there's nothing that's going badly we need you know we're fine and and i tried to caution there also ki you know let's let's be careful uh it's when we start feeling nothing can go wrong that things start going wrong you know the andy grove uh, of intel once had a phrase only the paranoid survive <laughs> that's so true wow uh, uh, that's certainly true in politics but i think it's absolutely true from national policy also as soon as you think there is nothing that can go wrong uh you stop uh, adjusting for the possibilities and they start happening so that was also important to warn about the things that could go wrong and to make sure that we were continuously sort of worried about covering uh, for those do you think you were a disliked guy i don't think so i think what i hear every time uh, of course these are only people who, who uh, you know this is a selected sample say i entered economics only because of you so that's 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 a nice nice feeling i found the press was looking for all the you know downside of the balance never talking about the upside um and and i don't know whether that was by design or whether they were just desperate to find some counter voices and so they amplified that and i was uh, you know um sometimes when i gave a speech and i read what what was going out on on media on that speech i said this is not the speech i gave mm. did anybody actually read the speech mm. because they picked up those bits So I I think there's a little bit of of that that goes on uh I, you know whether it is the uh, building up uh, like a narad uh the dissension uh, sells more papers uh, or uh, gets more uh, sort of uh, eyeballs or or whether there was an agenda there I I, I don't know but uh, but that 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 was the the problem balance speech has got taken to completely out of context okay i have a few things to say again going back to my pre podcast practice mm. of talking to people for the episode so right. of course i'll talk to a few people who understand economics right. i'll 
definitely always speak to extreme right and extreme left people right. to just draw out my guests image in their head right. uh as i said earlier everyone respected you right. the left people yeah. said that oh see people like uh, dr r r r r now uh, ostracized from the government sent away we need more people like that power the people in the extreme right yeah. and i'm giving you both the perspectives yeah, yeah, yeah. extreme right said that oh he clearly doesn't like the modi government and uh, you know some someone even said that, that there's a conspiracy theory attached to your name that you're working with the deep state yeah. and the deep state is supposedly the body that runs america yeah. as in the front is the present all this is conspiracy theory yeah, yeah. territory yeah, yeah. so they said that you're funded by the deep state there are yeah. accusations like this yeah. and that got me thinking yeah that wow media has really cooked up some stories on right. both sides right so now i'll pass the ball to you yeah and i'll let you clear all these misconceptions well i look you know first when out of government i have been critical regardless of the government in power because that's my job i mean we have enough people praising and of course you do offer some this is what is going well i was uh, before i became chief economic advisor in the manmohan singh government i was the i was an advisor to dr manmohan singh and i have a speech in uh, you know um i have a bunch of speeches talking about some of the concerns with uh, cronyism etc that were building up in india and you know i remember a, a panel where you know four of the participants uh, this was uh, celebrating uh, so many years since the liberalization four of the participants ishara luwalia me uh, tn nainan um uh, of the four the fourth was dr subara who was the rbi governor three criticized the government deeply there was a fifth participant which was dr manmohan singh who was the prime minister and he listened and he said i not for me to say anything i have to absorb this criticism and then act and he acted accordingly but the point is that anybody who wants just undiluted praise will go off track you know the emperor's new clothes yeah nobody wants to point out that the emperor has no clothes in this matter or that matter and you make mistakes huge mistakes which eventually i mean nobody has all the right answers if you suppress criticism you take advice only from a narrow coterie and you only listen to them and you kill all all uh, sort of r- adverse information adverse data uh, you get the po- politics of the soviet union mm. and uh, see where that ended up so it is important for independent outsiders to offer their concerns of course you know they can offer you know both sides but everybody is offering one side so when you offer the downside you look like a die mm. died in the wool critic i've already told you i love the uh fact that we've operationalized direct benefits i will tell you i like the fact that we're building out an infrastructure in ways we never did before these are all good things but there are sides that you uh you will criticize uh including the fact that you don't take criticism uh which is a problem which is why you will go off track in yep. many significant ways being a podcaster yeah. people want the other cabinet ministers to speak up right. and people would actually enjoy a little bit of self criticism a little bit of acknowledging their own mistakes i i think that that is important because it, the the one narrative pushes people like me who want a fair discussion to focus more on the downside because there's so much on only the upside everything is going well and i think the the issue of one person is is a very important issue actually there's a very interesting uh, quote from dr ambedkar the framer of the constitution where he said uh, bhakti in religion is a very good thing but we shouldn't transfer bhakti to politics because that kind of devotion to one person in politics is detrimental to the longer run sort of stability of the country in fact he said that leads to dictatorship and i think that is something that you know whether it was mrs indira gandhi or you know we have to caution against that kind of uh, sort of focus i mean uh, you know where is the rest of the cabinet why don't we have 
you know, a, a sense that, you know, Mr. Gadkari is doing a fantastic job on infrastructure. Why aren't more sort of achievements of cabinet ministers highlighted? Why is it always... Uh, and, you know, to some extent, it's also the power of the Prime Minister's office. I've said this many times. Having an overly powerful Prime Minister, India cannot be governed from a very, very narrow center, especially if that center doesn't try and build consensus. We saw what happened to the farm laws, right? So what we talk about uh, in this book that we put together, which I think is an important point about what we feel about going, what's going forward, that we need to rethink governance also at the same time as we're rethinking economics. Because the two go together. If we want to be successful in the 21st century, we need a governance for the 21st century. Okay. We have a governance for maybe the 20th century, maybe earlier. Uh, this is something I loved about Milan Devra, who was on the show. He had some incredible points that he made. When I asked him what he'd change about governance in general, he said, I'd change the whole system, honestly, because the system is built for 1947. And we're still following it. It has layers. It doesn't incorporate technology. Work doesn't move fast. Policy doesn't move fast. So he'd probably change the whole system. Uh, do you agree with that? That's my first question to you. Well, I, I, would, I would not start by saying we need to change the constitution. Uh, my sense is when you open things up too much, then you can get, get the wrong sort of change. Uh, we don't want to move from a democracy to a more authoritarian government by changing the constitution. In fact, what I think is we need far more democracy. So, for example, we talked earlier, how do you get politicians to focus on schools on healthcare. And I think one of the important changes that we talk about in the book is decentralization. How do you get the politician to focus? It has to be the primary responsibility of the politician. The politician sitting in Lucknow doesn't care about what happens in the village. The sarpanch in the village cares about what happens in the village. Supposing the sarpanch was in charge of the local school, rather than the minister sitting in Lucknow. Then if the school wasn't, you know, if the teacher wasn't showing up, if the school wasn't repainted, if it was falling apart, if the children didn't get the midday meal, Sarpanch would hear it very quickly. And the Sarpanch would not get re-elected in the next uh, election. That is an immediate empowerment of the people immediate cause and effect forces the serpent to do what the people need. And one of the biggest things people will tell you again and again we need is a good school for our children. So decentralization would make a difference. Now, uh, to your Deora point, point uh, the politics of 2040, uh, 1947. In 1947, what we wanted was to keep the country together. Too many forces, you know, splitting the country. Uh, after all, we had just been through partition. Getting the princely states to agree to join, uh, Hyderabad was still not uh, part, Pondicherry, uh, Goa, these are all had to be integrated. So in that, what we wanted was a strong central government. And, you know, we had states, but there was a partition of, uh, there was a division of labor between the states and the central government, but there was no need for a third level. And Ambedkar was very much against the third level because he said the village is a den of inequity. All the social ills come there. Of course, time has passed. Hmm. And today, what happens is that our uh, you know, state of Uttar Pradesh is the fifth largest country in the world. It's too big. It, India cannot be governed from the PMO in Delhi. It cannot be governed from the chief minister's uh, coterie in the state capital. It has to be much more decentralized for people to get what they need. And that is why I think we need that kind of governance reform. That's not about changing the constitution. It's about... Grassroot level governance. Grassroot. We have a third tier of government, which has been empowered by the amendments to the constitution in the 1990s. What we need is to make it operational because the states aren't giving funding. They aren't giving people. Uh, they aren't giving powers to the municipalities and to the villages. We need that level of transition to take place. Otherwise, everybody wants to keep power at that level and not let any go down. Hey, if you enjoyed today's clip, make sure you check out all the other clips we've uploaded on this channel. You'll find a clip related to almost every single topic as long as you're willing to search for it.